Hello. Hi, Zine. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the WhatsApp, uh, Tina. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I'll start the webinar now. And then it'll be clear. <laughs> Good morning, Zineb. Sam, Till. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining um, at the second edition of the Conversation Room of the FIAC happening at the Grand Palais Ephemer this year. Um, I'm Victoria, I'm taking care of the Conversation Room this year and I'm gonna very briefly introduce Zineb Sedira, Sam Bardawil and Til Fenera. Um, Zineb is the artist representing France at the next Venice Biennale in 2022. Um, Sam Bardawil and Sil Felrat, the curators of the French Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2022, as well as the Lyon uh, Biennale. They are also the director of the Hamburger Barnoff in Berlin. And Yasmina Regad, who were supposed to join us today as the curating team, but she's not able to, so she will be missed. But I'm letting Zineb and Sam until gone with the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Victoria, for the introduction. It's lovely to be here virtually. Um, and, um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to start talking a little bit about what we are developing and have been working on with Zinab over the last month for the French Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2022. Uh, perhaps we can start by talking a little bit about our friendship with Zinab and um, the way we have worked together in the past. Um, and then we can start zooming in a little bit about the Biennale, about the pavilion, keeping in mind that this is only a teaser. We're not going to say everything yet because things are still being cooked, um, but uh, we hope that this will be just the beginning of many conversations leading up to the Biennale. So, Perhaps this is how we will start, and then we can go more into detail. I don't know, before we do that, if Zinab has an introductory thing she would like to say or tell? Um, not really. <laughs> 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 well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, since you spoke about friendship, yeah, I don't know if you were going to expand on this one, but... Um... We obviously have known each other for quite some time. We've been, we worked the first time in 2009, I think, for sure that happened in 2010. And then we had other uh, project together <clears throat> and we kept seeing each other and meeting each other. Each time you were coming to London or, or we're meeting in a place or, or another, you were, you've always been very supportive or even if we were not working together, you'd come at openings and, and things like that. So um, that's our friendship. And the same with Yasmin Arigad, uh, who has been a you know, friend for a long time. And also her and I have created this residency project in Algiers. So that like also bounded us professionally. And, uh, and yeah, and, and as, as a friend. <laughs> And, and, and that we will see later on that this project for Venice is also about friendship. But perhaps I'll pass it on back to you, Sam. Yes, I mean, uh, until I'd say something, hello, hello, everyone. And uh, yes, Zineb, I think that's absolutely true. And I think sometimes people ask uh, a question, how long have you been working on the pavilion? And, you know, how do you work together? And I think the matter of fact is, I think we started working on this project in some sense, um, uh, maybe 12 years ago when we first met, you know, when we were working on this commission for the exhibition told and told retold in Doha. Um, as you said, we've had countless conversations, laughters, dinners, drinks. Um, we visited exhibitions together. So I think when we started approaching the pavilion, um, we already had a really, really solid starting base. And I think a great sense of trust. And I know that the same applies to Yasmina as well. I mean, you've known her for a very, very long time. You did many, many projects together, but also so did uh, Sam and I, we've known her for a very long time. So I think uh, the decision on your end uh, to bring us all together and work on um, as a team on this 
has been a really um, you know, fantastic experience for all of us. I think we complement one another in a really great way. Mm -hmm. And I also think that our role as curators um, of uh, this national pavilion perhaps is much more one of supporting you in uh, creating this project and perhaps you know, putting structures in place and giving you that safe place to, to create the work that you need to create. You know, it's a very exposed um, exhibition. It's this big solo project um, that comes with a lot of expectations, a lot of uh, baggage as well for being a national pavilion in Venice, for being the French national pavilion on top of it. So it comes with a lot of these kind of questions. Um, and I think Yasmina and I, I'm, I know that in this part, I can speak for her as well that I think we all feel very strongly about supporting you and, and giving you that support in all our different experiences and our different cultural backgrounds and just making sure that the pavilion um, that you envision will be um, as, as good as possible. And we've been really having a lot of fun in the process doing it. And uh, we know it's going to be a fantastic project and uh, we are very glad and excited to be part of it. Great. So basically what we can do now, I'm going to just show you a little evidence of all the crimes that we have committed together <laughs> in the past. So we've prepared just quickly a few visual things to show you. So Till, for instance, has already spoken about our first collaboration. This was back in 2009 when we started working on a new commission with Zinab for Told, Untold, Retold. It was the inaugural contemporary art exhibition for the Arab Museum of Modern Art, Mathaf in Doha. And that was really the beginning of a friendship. And here you see some of the evidence of that work. So this was the process. I think it's the other way around. Yes, it is the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically, um, um, you know, some of the documentation of the ideas of the process and how we were working together to develop an installation, um, which was then featured in many of Zinab's exhibitions in the future. So the end of the road is a two channel video installation um, that also kind of came with a series of light boxes that depicted uh, you know, images of um, a, a shipyard, a, a, a car a rack yard, where you see the destruction of these cars and the narration by Zinab on top of these very violent and sometimes pro perhaps almost you know, provocative images that have a certain undertone. Um, and obviously it's a commentary on migration, on um, you know, movement, on the connection and the inability perhaps to, to connect sometimes and the vehicles of connection and migration and communication. So that was just one of the very, very early, the first and, the er and earliest project we worked on. And then a few years later, it was in 2014, we invited Zinab on an exhibition um, at the Guangzhou Museum of Art um, in Guangzhou in South Korea. And we had the pr privilege to show Middle Sea, that these are images of the installation. So we showed uh, Middle Sea, one of Zinab's seminal iconic films, always in a sense, a continuation of some of these ideas that have been very central to her work. Um, and a selection of several of her photographic installations, you know, like Untitled, like Maritime Nonsense, like uh, The Lovers. So this was also another continuation of that uh, conversation that started uh, back in 2009. And then we had the privilege also to work with Zinab on uh, her first solo gallery uh, exhibition at Time War Grani Projects. Mm -hmm. I think that was in New York and that was back in 2016. Um, so mm -hmm. as you can see, every two or three years, we had an occasion to develop <laughs> something new. And that was also a very special project because it captured at the time a new body of work that Zirab had been developing, uh, had been developing Museum of Traces, um, uh, basically the sugar silos, um, uh, Registre du Phare. So you can see again, us having the opportunity to continue our work with Zinab and accompany her over the years on different occasions with different different uh, different series and bodies of work, um, and then of course along these uh, as these projects were developing, we were always seeing her other projects or other exhibitions. The friendship was always developing. Um, and this is, in a sense, just to give you a little context of how the work that we're doing now on the pavilion is just a continuation of a long process of exchange, of nurture, of um, 
being, you know, springboards for each other to think together, to reflect together and grow together. So thank you, Zina, for, for giving us this opportunity to continue this beautiful journey with you. And uh, maybe building on that a little bit, um, while of course we cannot talk about the project for Venice in detail, there has to be also a little bit of a surprise, but I think we can maybe talk about some of the main concerns in your practice. And I think the examples that uh, Sam uh, was giving here are actually really, really uh, powerful. And perhaps we can ask you a first question. You know, you are representing France, um, but you've been living in the UK for, I think, over 25 years. You are British as much as you're French. But of course, you're also born to an Algerian family in, in Paris and in France. So you have these three different cultures in you. And now here you are representing France at the Venice Biennale with all the expectations that the pavilion carries. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about this idea of uh, identity and how do you deal with this in this highly politicized context and this complex, you know, societies and everything that comes with it. Um, and how it links a little bit to your personal um, history and your personal biography. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously, when <clears throat> when you um, are nominated for to, to do something like that to represent a country, whatever the country is, mm -hmm. comes into mind what it means. This idea of the na nation of the of the the, the 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 mother country and all this question about you know identity politics comes comes up and um, and uh, of course, like you said uh, very rightly, I'm French, I'm British, and I'm Algerian also. Um, just because I've been um, really uh, experiencing those three kind of cultural uh, elements within my, uh, uh, of course, for the French and the Algerian during my childhood and later on, and, and Britain more as an adult when I decided to go and live in England. Um, later on, and I also studied art in the UK rather than in France. Uh, so, <clears throat> of course, uh, this question of, am I French? do I deserve representing France was an interesting one because I did think actually that was exactly the right thing to be doing to actually show that the French pavilion can also be Algerian and can also be British as much as it can be French. And that now, if you look at the demographics of, of France or any or other European countries, you don't have any more uh, this kind of identity of being purely French, whatever that means, because you know France being mixed for a long time by perhaps more at the time European immigration, but more recently more by African and North African uh, immigrants. So I think it's actually fantastic to be able to do a project, uh, my project that might be based perhaps, or perhaps not in, within those three kind of uh, countries, but beyond that, because we might be coming and experiencing those identities, but our research, our travels, our artists might have also made us interested or attached to another culture, another country, uh, purely because we like or we, 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 the experience we had there, you know, has proven to be very rich. So yes, we have this kind of formal identities. In my case, it's French Algerian because I'm, I've got the nationality, I've got the passport of those two countries. Britain is because of my long lasting adult experience. And then there are other countries where I tend to gravitate towards too, just because either I like people there, I like the history, I you know, I just like going there. So, um, I mean, we all know now that identity is not a fixed kind of a concept or, or, or notion anymore. That, I mean, I don't know really anyone who has one identity. I mean, everyone comes from somewhere. Um, and, and therefore, therefore, I think the French pavilion is totally uh, uh, fitted, appropriate to, to me, because I am also French. Absolutely, Zineb. I think, you know, this is not something that is just something that you see in France, you see it in many, many other countries. And <clears throat> even if you are maybe subscribing more closely to one identity, doesn't mean that you have many, many other identities or cultural groups that you belong to. Um, and as you say, many people nowadays actually have more than one culture, you know, one yeah. group by either being of mixed heritage or by having lived in different countries. You know, I think the idea that you have to subscribe to one singular entity seems very irrelevant to the reality of many people nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, when you migrate, you can even connect with your country more easily through Zoom, you can travel easily, you can speak more than one language in a household. And I think that reality 
is something that is really wonderful um, to uh, to embrace. And, and I think you are embracing this. You are not so different. I think you probably represent much more the majority of people uh, in mm -hmm. reality um, uh, when one takes a second look than maybe one takes a first look. And maybe what we can also uh, speak a little bit about is how um, that manifests itself in, in the pavilion in a formal way. You always have uh, been a great filmmaker. You did realize many, many projects um, also involving your own family, very autobiographical, but you have always used film as a medium um, in your practice since the very beginning. And you were also, you know, um, telling us all the anecdotes of going to the cinema in the Jeanne Villiers where you grew up um, with your dad. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what does cinema represent to you personally and um, how do you think it is a great medium to express um, what you're trying to express in this perhaps complicated context? But can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with cinema and what will happen maybe a little bit um, going forward? I mean, it's true from a very young age, I had a privilege in some ways relationship with my father who would take me to the cinema in Jean Villiers, um, a cinema that doesn't exist anymore uh, for, for, for the first cinema I went to. And it was a cinema where my dad would take me to see uh, Italian cinema, popular cinema or popular cinema and, and the Italian film we were watching were the peplums, of course, and, and the Western spaghetti. And, um, and then also uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, Egyptian uh, movies uh, shown in that cinema. Um, it was a cinema, although it was uh, run by French uh, owners, the majority of the people who come to cinema were uh, from the immigrant community. Um, and I think that's why they were showing films who were more populist, perhaps, rather than a, a more intellectual kind of a cinema, if you want. So, yeah, I was in, informed by a very young age by all those peplums, you know, which I find were amazing. And, of course, the Egyptian one with the music, the dancing, the kissing, the whatever. So, I, I mean, you know, uh, they were quite interesting juxtapositions just to really, when you think about it now. Um, but they were definitely made for, you know, populist kind of a cinema, you know. And, um, and then during my, my teenagers years, uh, because Genevieve being a, a communist uh, city, and uh, it, it also had a, a cinema called, Maison, at the time it was called La Maison pour tous, now it's called Cinema Jean Vigo. I think it was created in the 1930s. But I started going there as a teenager because then we moved from where the other cinema was to a closer estate near the Jean Vigo cinema. So my cinema interest uh, carried on developing as a teenager. But the cinema Jean Vigo, it was more like a cinema d'arrêt d'essai. The films were much more either political, militant, or, or artistic, if you want. So I kind of, uh, yeah, from a very yeah, young age, in some ways, uh, um, yeah, escaped in the in those cinema spaces. Um, of why the medium of cinema or film uh, in my practice? It's also because I'm really interesting on, on in stories, in telling stories, and to listening to stories. And what what best way to actually record a story is via video or sound recording. And and the film space or the video space gives you that um, possibility to record sound as well as. Uh, the voice and the face. So I've, I've uh, for a long time, I've kind of de developed a strategy which looks more at interview, kind of like the piece I did with my parents, the piece I did with me and my mom and my daughter. It was always a kind of quite, quite simple kind of way of, of, of filming. And then the work changed a bit in 2001, where I started not involving people anymore, actors. So it became between fiction and, and reality. And then more recently, I went back to this idea of the archives and started working in the archive. I wanted to record um, people to speak about some element of the archive. And you can see that, for example, with uh, Guardian d'Image, uh, where Safia Kwasi talks about her husband, Mohamed Kwasi, and his the photography took between, during the Algerian War of Independence. And of course, the work is about Mohamed Kwasi, who died a long time ago, but it's also about um, a homage to Safia Kwasi, who is obviously trying to carry on the legacy of her husband, uh, as well as talking about her own uh, uh, 
life story with the husband, the love story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we jumped uh, to uh, another example. For example, in Laughter in Hell, this project, uh, which I hope is not a, a premonition, but Laughter in Hell, because we spend a lot of time in our project. Uh, giggling and laughing a lot and telling jokes, but I, I was always interested by jokes and humor. And that also comes from my father, by the way, yes. who is a, a great joker. For sure. Still today, <laughs> and you have met him, so you know it's true. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, so in Laughter in Hell, in that project, I also did uh, an interview with a journalist, Mustafa Ben Benfodil, about this period of the 90s, what we call the Décennie Noir, the Black Decade, where there was a lot of killings of caricaturists and intellectuals at the time, and how the caricature and the oral jokes were um, portrayed, were used in order to not only disseminate uh, what was happening in Algeria, but also as, as a way to relief perhaps, or to also protest and resist what was going on at the time. Uh, and then there was another interview with El Elizabeth Perego, an American academic who's wrote uh, a huge amount of, of texts around this idea of, of the joke and the humor in, during wars, uh, and, and especially in her case, um, targeted to Algeria. So yes, this format of the interview comes back all the time. The archive also in Laughter in Hell was there. And then you find again the archive, but less, but not, yeah, with one interview, perhaps a, a video interview in uh, the piece that I showed at the Jeu de Paume two years ago. Um, <clears throat> And where there, again, I'm looking at the Pan-African Festival of 1969 in Algiers. I do an interview with uh, Nadira Lagoon, who talks about her experience because she was 18 when the festival happened. And she talks about what it meant at, as a woman Algerian of that age to experiment this kind of amazing uh, context mm -hmm. that was the festival or, or this Pan-Africanism that happened there in, in Algeria at the time with all those kind of militant groups that were based in Algeria with all those musicians, dancers, actors, filmmakers uh, from abroad and from Africa who were there. And, um, and, and then in some ways, uh, because I did the Jeu de Pomme project and I was very lucky to have access to a lot of archival material from the Cinematheque of Algiers, um, I was able to also discover that Algeria in the post-independence really, um, the state of Algeria had created, had wanted, it was part of the policy in some ways to actually create a, a certain type of cinema, which is a, a, a militant cinema, an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, but also anti-capitalist cinema. And, uh, and, and the model was a Cuban cinema that was uh, created in Cuba at the time, in the early 60s. Uh, so, so that cinema was uh, inviting uh, a lot of uh, um, African, uh, Middle Eastern filmmakers, countries, uh, filmmakers who were coming from countries who perhaps didn't have the same relationship to yeah. cinema, but Algeria had decided to put money to a lot of those films and were financing a lot of those um, uh, 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 um, filmmakers who were just coming out from uh, decolonized or still perhaps colonized countries. And I, I can think of uh, Youssef Shaheen, Joseph Saab for, for Lebanon, but may, many, many also sub-Saharan African countries, mm -hmm. uh, filmmakers from those uh, territories were also uh, commissioned film. But Algeria didn't stop there. Algeria also wanted to work with, um, with international or, or, or European filmmakers. And they, by doing so, they were also opening up that same militant cinema, but to a, a broader audience, if you want. And then they work with Costa Gavras on Z, for example, that was commissioned uh, or financed in part by Algeria. We, we all know about the Battle of Algiers by Gilo Portoncovo, we, you know, to mention another French one, Elise ou la vraie vie, de Michel Drac was also financed by Algeria. Le Bal from Eteroscola was financed by France, Algeria, and Italy. Um, so, so there was a very interesting kind of uh, connection between Italy, France, and Algeria in terms of cinema. Let's not forget that the Cinematheque of Algiers was created in 65 with the help of the Cinematheque Francaise. So you can see all those kind of link, but they were often linked. They were often political links because those people in France or in Italy who wanted to work with Algeria or were seeking sometimes help from Algeria 
finance, financial help often, it was also because they were adhering to the political kind of anti-colonial kind of ideas. Um, of course, they needed money to make films, but it's, it's also because for them, Algeria was representing this kind of uh, 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 anti-colonial kind of, um, and um, and a lot of those films were shot like Z from Costa Cava were entirely shot in, in Algeria. L'étranger de Visconti mm -hmm. was also entirely shot uh, in Algeria. So, um, so just to finish and to link it to the, uh, the French pavilion to come. And for the French pavilion, of course, I decided to carry on with that research and to actually uh, center the project within three countries or three cities. So Algiers, Paris, and um, Venice. Why Venice? Because of course there is a Mostra of Venice. And also because in 66, the Mostra of Venice gave the first prize to a co-production film co-produced between Algeria and Italy, and it was the Battle of Algiers. So Venice for me had a very interesting, yeah, important yeah, space, but also because the Biennale is there, you know, and the French pavilion is set in. Uh, so so there is this very exciting conceptual link to, to Venice, of course, you know, to the city where the Biennale is taking place. Um, I think you talked a little bit maybe about the larger political context in which uh, cinema sits, but I think um, maybe we can add a little bit the personal autobiographical part in your practice, which is extremely strong and very, very present. You know, we also, when we met your parents, you know, uh, for example, and we spent time with them and you're right, your father is a great joker, but there's also a wonderful warmth and, you know, there are really... <laughs> extremely warm and, and lovely people. And I think there's a certain warmth and a very, very powerful human spirit that also is in your work. Um, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how do you see your practice, you know, maybe uh, in this question of activism or humanity, or like, how do you convey personal messages? I mean, it's clear that you use in many ways your, your autobiographical story and who you are as a person, perhaps to talk about the bigger stories. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you see your practice sitting in this um, discourse. Yeah, I mean, it is true that uh, each time I, I, I make a piece of work and I want to talk about some kind of political context, I always use my experience or the experience of my parents, which is my experience too in some ways, because you know we, we live through what our parents have, uh, have uh, experience, you know, uh, and in the case of my parents, it was the Algerian war, it was the immigration in France, uh, it was the many languages we were talking. At one point, I was also spending my, my time between Paris and Belgium, so I was also informed by this kind of other life that I was spending in Belgium, and, um, and, <clears throat> and I do personally believe as an artist that um, for me to talk about political political issues, you have to talk about the personal, or you don't have to, but it makes more sense to, to talk about politics via the personal rather than talk. Um, there are some artists who do, you know, it differently and very well, more as an activist kind of a, uh, artwork. But in my case, it was always, I always felt the personal was important. I have a great relationship with my parents. Like you said, they're very funny and, and lovely. I mean, really, there is no other word. They're just kind and warm. And, and, and then throughout my practice, as I became myself a mother also and an artist, I seek um, this kind of relationship with, with creators, with people I interview in my films. I always, hence why perhaps I often interview people of a certain age, because they remind me somehow my parents and often they give that kind of warmth. Uh, oh, but that's also the people I know the best. And that's the people I feel I can work the best with. That doesn't mean I don't work with younger. Obviously I have done, but um, so yes, yeah, so a personal is important. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I represent also all those kind of past histories, uh, as I was saying, you know, uh, I didn't leave the, the Algerian war, but I can tell you I heard so many stories and I and the same for the Pan-African Festival, you know, I didn't leave it, I wasn't even born when it happened and my parents were not even there, but there was a lot of discussion around that kind of very uh, rich period of Algeria, which lasted perhaps till the mid seventies with the non-aligned countries and the, the Pan-Africanism uh, Pan and then that became also the Pan-Arabism. So that kind of very much informed me as a child. And sometimes you think that children don't understand, but you still like a sponge, you still kind of 
uh, absorb all the stories and it's only later on that suddenly they make sense or they come back to you. And then you like, yes, okay, I'm gonna do this. I forgot about the cinema for that period with my father until recently I remembered it. Mm -hmm. um, and my father confirmed the name of the cinema and everything, you know, and, and yeah, and that was great, you know. And I think all these stories, I think that you were um, telling us and also, you know, that your parents were sharing with us, you know, whether it's the Paris massacre and the Algerians in, in 61 or your personal biographies, how they arrived and how they constructed a life eventually in, in, in France, having their children. And so all of these anyway are in your practice. And I think you're always such a wonderfully sensitive artist to kind of make a synthesis of all those things into, into the project. And I think what's very exciting, and then maybe Sam will talk a little bit about one aspect of the pavilion that we can talk about, which is the, the publication part. But I think maybe just to finish one more question from my side is, um, you know, this sort of synthesis and then the language of cinema there is, of course, a creation of, you know, what's real and, uh, you know, what is fiction and how do you tell a history? How do you tell a past? You know, what does it mean in the present moment? And how does it connect? And I think it was very exciting, actually, to sit in your living room, not only many, many times in London, but actually also in Paris, <laughs> in the exhibition at the Jeux de Pomme um, a couple of years ago, where you really brought your living room there and sort of the staging of reality or something, which is also a great departure point for the, for the pavilion, as Sam is just showing the catalog here. But maybe you can tell us um, just really briefly, um, before then I give the word to Sam, about this project where you brought your living room um, with all the objects and here we have a picture of the living room um, all the objects um, the furniture the there's a certain warmth a certain you know personal touch that it brings but at the same time that's exactly how you would talk about history I mean you also have a wonderful dress sense that always connects to the 60s we're seeing you right now as well you know there's this playing of time Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the formal choices of bringing that living room there, how that came about, and how this is maybe something we will explore as a little teaser, perhaps, also in Venice. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it was quite interesting because I was doing a lot of research into the 60s, which is, of course, and for a long time has been my favorite period of time in terms of design and clothing and just the way things were made, etc. 60s, 70s. Um, and uh, and then suddenly I was in my living room. I remember with a friend calling me out, just in case she listens to me now. <laughs> um, and we're talking about those ideas. And then um, she said to so Colin says to me, but look around you, you're surrounded by the 60s. And I thought, yeah, she's right, actually. Perhaps I should actually bring my home, my living room, um, into that space. And the living room for me is very much a a space of conviviality, of hosting, of sharing, sharing food, conversation. So for me, the living room became in some ways a metaphor for the Pan-African Festival, which was a space of sharing, discussing, listening to music, dancing. I did many parties in my living room in Brixton, uh, many dinners, many conversation. Uh, uh, and also that's where my children uh, also uh, grew up. And uh, there is uh, family photos of the children of my parents in there, but also great kind of small uh, furniture bits that are Thing like great designs, you know, and, and, and paintings, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a nice collection of, of, of film posters from the, you know, vintage film posters from the, I'm somebody who collects, I'm somebody who goes to a vintage fair or to flea markets. That's something I do doing, and it's a pastime, but in that instance, for that piece of the Jeudi Pomme, it became more than a pastime, it became a, a part of the work, it became me, you know, making work. And that was really, um, really nice. Of course, it was painful to have to send all my furniture away and having to buy a new one because uh, when you've lived for 20 years or more with some furniture, so it, and actually when my son came as a jeu de paume and said, mom, what did you do? All our furniture is here, you know? And I said, don't worry, I've got some new ones, you know, at home. But yeah, it was very, very personal. For me, perhaps out of all my practice, this one was the most personal one because, you know, it had the stains on the sofa, the marks of the cups on the table. He had all this kind of uh, 20 years of traces of my life with my children and my friends in that space, as well, of course, of a lot of 1960s um, elements. But I must say a lot of those 1960s elements were connected some somehow to Algeria, North Africa or Africa, 
So I was unconsciously buying, you know, statues and things like that. We were made in Africa in the 60s or in Algeria or whatever. So there was still this kind of pan-Africanism within my own living room without me realizing that unconsciously I was, I had collected this element. So it was just a beautiful kind of encounter that my living room was totally fitting yeah. that kind of the whole uh, pan-African um, concept, if you want. You know, what, what I think is, if I may intervene, what I, what I think is very, very interesting in this particular kind of employment of your living room or inserting it into the context of, uh, of a museum space, in the case of the Jeu de Pomme, which is perhaps something that might be repeated in some way or shape or form or not in the context of the French pavilion, um, is that there's this very, very interesting conflation of what is real and what is staged, what is fiction and what is real history, what is, um, um, you know, it is your living room, but then it suddenly becomes a signifier um, of something that goes beyond your personal biography. It's activated, it's, there's a new agency that's transported into it just because it's now, you know, being employed or coerced into a different type of uh, staging. And I think that these are some of the conversations that we've been having also together over the last few months. What does it mean to stage a project in the context of perhaps the ultimate form of staging, which is the staging of a nation, the staging of a country? And, um, and in a way, this has been also one of the underlying questions that has filtered into the way we've thought about um, how can you represent these conversations? How can we relate the process of this project in a way that is not just a finished product that you get at the end of the you know, process, but actually something that accompanies us throughout the period. And this is where um, you, know, you, you, you came up with this amazing idea that has now started to take shape, um, which is the publication of the pavilion. Um, so in this way, Zina, from the beginning, was, was very, very uh, clear that she did not want to work on a final catalogue that you get at the end, you know, when the exhibition opens um, as a finished product, but actually to create something that grows, that is nurtured by the conversations and the creative process that we're engaged in, and that becomes another form of conviviality. You were talking about your living room as a place of encounter where friends, your extended family of friends and intellectuals and artist colleagues and curators, but your personal family as well, all your worlds converged in that space. And in a way, perhaps this publication, this review or journal is also another platform for this extended family of friends and intellectuals and artists and thinkers to meet to come together. And um, I think this is such a generous gesture on your behalf, Sinab, to kind of not just think about what you want to say, but actually expand it so that other voices are equally included and are given the opportunity to talk about um, things that are relevant to the bigger questions that you want to evoke and you want to trigger through the project of the pavilion. So um, as Zineb was saying, um, the, the three cities that were very, very important for her throughout her career and her personal life obviously were Paris, because that's where she was born and grew up and lived for many, many years. Um, there's Venice, which is going to be the place where many aspects of her life are going to be immersed and confronted and condensed into the context of um, a staged national pavilion. But then, of course, there's Algiers, the background, the beginning, in a sense, the history of her personal family, and, of course, the questions of post-coloniality post um, and all the issues that have to do with ideas of identity, identity politics, immigration, and so on and so forth. So three journals or three numbers of this journal are going to be released over the next few months leading up to the pavilion. And this is the first issue, which this afternoon, Yasmina and Zina will be talking about in more detail at the FIAC. Um, the first issue takes the city of Algiers as its starting point. The second one will focus on Paris. 
And of course, traces of London will get into it as well, because that's part of your story too. But then the third one will be the one that focuses on Venice and the uh, Italian context. Of course, always going back to cinema, always going back to the language of cinema and to the history of militant cinema, 60s and 70s, and the co-productions that were happening between these three countries within the context of a discourse that was seeking to challenge, perhaps think of projects of na nation building, think of post-colonial um, uh, ways of being and challenging you know, the, the narratives that were inherited from previous imperial powers. So I'm going to now switch to my screen just to kind of show you a little bit um, some of those spreads. So as you can see, we were looking at the cover and um, each, of the, each of the issues will have also a subtitle that goes under the city. So the first one is forms of desire. And in this first issue, we're talking a lot about the desire to make cinema. Why and what kind of forms does desire have? And how is desire, how can desire be a, a force? How is desire uh, perhaps a sort of agency that underlines the urge to make film, to create cinema, to capture images, to capture moments in time that can be then re-edited and retold in different ways to challenge a certain status quo or to make us question certain um, situations that have to do with post-colonial realities. So in a sense, um, in this case, you can see um, the language or the visual language of the issues of the journal is very, very much uh, inspired and kind of uh, appropriating the imagery of some of these militant journals or manifestos um, or reviews that were connected to film, that were connected to music, to African, to festivals like the Pan-African Festival, to certain biennales that were starting to circulate in the region at the time when we talk about the Alexandria Biennale, the Baghdad Biennale and other places in the world, of course. Um, so you will see a lot of that in the, in the review. This is also a very, very beautiful example. Um, but we also see, for instance, that every now and then, names and contributions from artists, colleagues, friends, the extended family, as we were saying, of Zina pop up, who were very also uh, excited by Zina's invitation to actually have a certain voice. So for instance, this is an example of from Joanna Hadji Thomas and Khalil Jrej, friends and colleagues and collaborators, and their film, uh, Je veux voir, from 2007, 2006, they started working on it, in which they actually trace certain um, um, traces, I would say, or they map out certain traces of the experience of uh, the war in 2006 in Lebanon. Um, and then in the middle of the journal, there's always going to be a spread, which is in a way, uh, it's very special contribution by Zina, an edited, uh, you know, a, a collage uh, uh, that will be a poster that you can then take out and include in your collection of uh, Zina Bophilia, <laughs> uh, you know. And then, of course, here you see another thing from Lord Povo. But then there's an opening to other disciplines. So, for instance, I want to show you, um, for instance, here. Uh, we invited Nabil uh, Jadwani, um, a very you know, close also part of Zinab's uh, collaborators and friends to curate, uh, sorry, to curate um, a music, uh, you know, a playlist of songs from the period that also comment or relate to these issues. We invited Lea Morin, you know, co-founder um, uh, of Talitha in France, an independent research, researcher and film curator to curate a, a film program that's also connected to uh, the ideas and the questions that Zinab is asking. And then we reprinted a text that looks at the post-colonial uh, context, as you can see here, within the um, Australian uh, context. So an opening up on different geographies also to kind of complement different positions and different places and different voices. So you can see this is um, a very, very um, uh, heterogeneous, I would say, um, collection of texts, of images, of reprints, of reproductions, um, and also of images that uh, relate to the process 
of research that Zeynab has been undergoing over the years, especially in the last year and a half leading up to the uh, Biennale in uh, the, the pavilion in Venice, where she has been visiting the Cinematheque in Algiers, the Cinematheque in Paris, uh, you know, in Rome, and collecting materials that have been nourishing the research and the work that she's been doing. And some of these images appear um, in the, you know, appear in the actual review. So these are all images that Zinab took while doing her research. And these are images that signal a little bit the aesthetic and the forms that we will actually encounter um, in the pavilion um, when, we, when we actually get to experience it together um, in Venice. So uh, Zina, perhaps you want to add a few things about the journal. Not really, I think you said it all uh, very clearly and very well. I mean, all I can uh, reiterate is this idea of, of friendship and, and, and community really, whereby for me it was important that uh, uh, people I know, I respect, I read, I, uh, yeah, I respect to take part when they could, when they wanted, um, um, and to give them also a, a, a voice within the, the context of the chosen subject of the newspaper uh, itself. But um, no, I mean, really, I can't see, uh, I just hope, um, you know, obviously we, we send invitations, some people can contribute, some can't. Uh, but I mean, so far people have been very excited uh, uh, to contribute in such kind of format. I believe it's the first time at the French Pavilion, the catalog format would take uh, place in, in free journal in English and in French, then on case in a box. So you'd be able to buy the box at the end of the, when, when the opening happens in, in uh, April now, end of April. Uh, and, and of course the box also, you know, another reference to the archives. But yes, I mean, as much as I like going to flea markets, I love going to archives and libraries and museums and look through their archive and, and I compile tons and tons of images that I find interesting through the iPhone, which has been my savers um, and uh, my saver. And, uh, and in some ways it's the same kind of, as uh, this idea of collecting comes back also through these images of archives that we put into the journal. Um, you know what's um, what's really special, I think, about this whole um, kind of uh, endeavor is not only the generosity, I think, that you are extending to all your friends and your colleagues that have somehow either contributed or nourished or inspired or uh, challenged you perhaps at different phases of your life. But I think the whole kind of approach is one that is very, very much, if I, were, if I could think of one word that kind of summarizes this whole experience is that of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, uh, perhaps we can say that the, the, the experience of the, of, the, of the project, both the process leading to it, but also perhaps one of the main uh, signals that will be put out there through the installation, through the you know, uh, exhibition itself, is one of solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this, in a sense, becomes a way of connecting to that spirit, to that moment in time where in Algiers, as you were saying, but also in many other countries in the world that were coming out from a colonial reality and were mm -hmm. thinking about, so what does it mean for us to be independent? What, does, what is independence and what is nation and what is a people? Um, and in a sense, there was, there was a moment of self-confidence where everything felt possible, everything seemed attainable. So on one hand, a lot of these, it's this younger generation of intellectuals and thinkers and filmmakers and artists, of course, visual artists, painters, sculptors, were looking at the past and mining their own histories and mining perhaps certain corners of their history that were completely discarded or marginalized because they were not uh, at all optimal for the, you know, colonial power. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to find new sources to build uh, or a vernacular on which they could build their mm -hmm. own identity. Mm -hmm. But then very quickly, you see that there's a turn towards an openness. It's mm -hmm. not enough to just think about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a singular way internally, mm -hmm. but the only way forward is to actually create these links and open up the conversation. And I think in a way, 
the, the, the project for the pavilion and the way you've been approaching it is a very, very um, appropriate kind of condensed microcosm of these two lines. On one hand, there's your personal, very, very micro way of looking at your own history, but then at very, very interesting and sometimes unexpected moments, the person that opens up to become collective, to mm -hmm. become about conversations, to become about relationships, to become about unexpected alliances. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this is one of those unexpected alliances with Yasmina, or maybe it is an unexpected one. But this is where the magic starts happening. And this is where new meanings are found, when the personal and the collective conflate and confront, when the real and the fictional also overlap. And I think these are all unbelievably pertinent tropes of thinking and strands that are perfect for the platform of a pavilion. And how do you critique and question yes. that entire construct? And perhaps just to add one sentence, which I think you've always done so beautifully in your work, it is not really about actually dividing people. I think it's always the opposite. I think you've always tried to bridge. I mean, it's also who you are with your different cultural identities all in one. I think there is this great kind of, um, you know, creating a sense of invitation and openness that everybody, I think, will be able to find themselves in it and engage and uh, reflect on what is happening. So I think it's going to be an extremely strong presentation that you're that you're working on. I think mm -hmm. we can't wait to actually see it come to life. You know, I think there's so many fantastic, fantastic layers, incredible departures also in your practice as an artist while totally staying true to, to who you are as a human uh, being and as a person. And I I'm very positively sure that it's something that will appeal to everyone, no matter where they come from. Uh, I think everybody will be able to relate and connect and feel, I think, very proud and excited about this representation within the context of the French Pavilion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the element of participation from an audience will be is something that I am very interested in uh, because I've experienced it with a living room. Um, I mean, in any exhibition, when you show a film or whatever, there is always a participation of the audience because they come into the space, they sit or they don't, but you know, but this is pushed even further when you have somebody sitting in your living room, uh, having a drink, chatting, looking at books or whatever, looking, yeah. So, so that's something I'm really interested in. And obviously we all understood by now that cinema, is at the core of the project for Venice and all the, all the strat strategies taken and, and seen and viewed in the making of a film will be, um, will be explored uh, for the project. And, and especially the kind of the make-believe kind of uh, aspect of cinema, the trompe l'oeil, the, you know, all those kind of uh, elements will be, um, will, be, uh, will be there, you know. We can't say more than that, but I think we've said already. Quite we're, we're, we've said enough. We'd <laughs> love to say more, but we're not. We're resisting. <laughs> Great. Yeah. But so, maybe just to tell people also, you know, um, Yasmina will be at FIAC with you later today, I think at two o'clock. Um, and for those of you who are interested in joining and coming and also getting a copy of the journal, it will be available there, um, the one that yeah. we have here. And um, you've got also a French version of that, yeah. Yes. There's a French and English version available this afternoon. So Yasmina will be there in person. Um, and, and we will talk a bit uh, a bit more about uh, the journal with Yasmina. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zineb, Sam, and Till. Thank you for your time and speaking from your hearts and sharing your experiences, your life work your childhood, even your friendship. It was an incredible conversation, thank you. We're now super teased and we cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> Venice Biennale in, in 2022 and the French Pavilion, of course. And then I'm gonna conclude this and thank FIAC, Jennifer Flay and Charlotte Ardon for putting this together, having uh, the idea of, of giving this space to conversation and allowing everyone to join and listen to these incredible subjects from the comfort of their home or offices everywhere in the world. Um, and thank you for joining. And then we hope everyone enjoyed as much as we did creating this conversation. Have a lovely day. And this concludes the conversation room of FIAC this year. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.